but coffee enemas are totally different. The goal is not to get stool out. And a lot of people think that's the primary objective, but the main reason is so that it can help with glutathione production. In this next episode, I get to interview Ashley Taylor. She's a board certified nurse that is now a personal coach and lifestyle strategist. In this episode, we talk all things coffee enema. Coffee enema is something that I was seeing pop up a lot online for people who wanted to take their health to the next level. I was really curious how these worked, what they were for, and honestly, I was really overwhelmed by how to start the process. Ashley put me through her course, and I'm now happy to say that coffee enemas are something that I use in my regular routine. I absolutely love the effect that they've had on my health, and I'm so excited for you to learn more. Enjoy. Welcome, Ashley Taylor. Ashley is a board-certified nurse and personal coach and lifestyle strategist. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you on everything you've taught me about coffee enemas. Thank you for having me here. It's a taboo topic, but I'm very excited to dive in. Yeah, I met you uh, not too long ago at an event in Sarasota at our friend Dr. John's office, and instantly I was just attracted to you. You have such an incredible passion around health and what you're doing, clearly. And then when I started following you on Instagram, that's what piqued my interest on coffee enema. I had always heard about it, but honestly felt a little bit overwhelmed and intimidated. And I love your style. I feel like you take this topic that's like can be overwhelming and you add humor to it. You make it so attainable and it's, you know, you made it so easy for me to incorporate into my life and clearly other people. I know you've taught over 8,000 people how to incorporate coffee enemas. Yes. I first learned about it in 2016 from my Chinese medicine doctor. And at the time I thought I was so open-minded and then he told me about coffee and mess and I was like, what? It just conflicted with a lot of things that I learned in nursing school. Obviously I learned to do enemas. I'd done hundreds at that point. What we typically see in a hospital is a water enema, soap suds enema, maybe a uh, fleet enema, but never a coffee enema. So it took me about four months to, I had the supplies, but it took about four months for me to work up the courage to do it. And it's really interesting what I noticed as an effect, but that's how I got started back in 2016. Amazing. Okay. I have questions just from that. So um, I want to know why are certain things used in a hospital? Like what's the purpose and intention of an enema from a traditional medicine standpoint? And then mm -hmm. what about in, let's call it natural medicine and why do we use coffee? Okay, so typically when we think of an enema, we think of a water enema or a fleet enema. A fleet enema is something that you can get at a drugstore. It's typically maybe four ounces, and that is saline that goes in just the lower part of the rectum. It's not a lot of fluid, and that can help to manually flush out some stool. So that would be appropriate in the hospital for someone who is constipated in general, maybe after surgery. Um, water enemas... You could also do that if someone was not having as much success with a fleet enema, but coffee enemas are totally different. The goal is not to get stool out. And a lot of people think that's the primary objective. It is something that happens. And as I'm sure you might know, if you put in three cups of coffee, a lot more than just coffee comes out and a lot of solid stuff. So that catches people by surprise. But the main reason is so that it can help with glutathione production. And we can talk more about how that works. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I know that it works is because I was reluctantly doing them, but I also had um, a drug test. I used cannabis and that was not something I could do when I was working. So I would have to stop before a contract. So typically it would take me about 14 to 25 days to pass one of my home tests. And then in doing coffee enemas, I noticed I passed it in nine days. And I just couldn't believe it because I knew that it helped with detoxification, mm -hmm. but to see that I'm like, Whoa, could this be from the coffee enemas? Yeah. And once again, that was back in 2016, I repeated the process and it really, really helps not only with getting substances out of our system, parasite cleansing, headaches, um, if I have menstrual cramps, which is very rare, but there are so many things that it can help with because of the glutathione production. All right. So let's touch on that. I think a lot of my followers probably do know what glutathione is, but for those who don't, what is glutathione and why is it important? So glutathione is the body's master antioxidant and detoxifier. One dose of Tylenol, which we give all the time in the hospital, can deplete our levels for up to seven days. 
So I'm not anti-Tylenol. I'm a freedom girl. Whatever's right for you is what I'll support. But I also think if we're taking things that are decreasing our levels of glutathione and knowing how important it is, this is one way that we can get it. When taken by mouth, glutathione doesn't really do much. I know some people have liposomal forms they'll take, but you can do it IV, which means you have to actually go somewhere. And I find it to be a little uncomfortable. I don't know if you've ever received it that way. Yeah. And actually, Dr. John, our mutual friend, he makes suppositories with glutathione. So I love those when traveling. Amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I had told you this when you were answering my questions about the coffee enemas. I can't do IV glutathione. And we're still figuring out, you know, what that is. I have, I mean, it's clearly like a major detox reaction. So whether it's Lyme that's left over, I know if I get one, I'm going to basically feel like I have the flu for a good 24 or 48 hours. So I was, it's like, I knew that I needed them. I know that glutathione is good for me, but just wasn't up for feeling that way. So I loved when I heard you say that I had no idea that that's one of the things that coffee enemas does. It increases our, uh, our body's ability to make its own glutathione, which is incredible. Yes. And I also find that it is not giving me the overwhelming effects that I had when I was doing it IV. It almost felt like pressure in the vein. I would have really bad body odor that day. And I don't think more is better. A lot of these things that I recommend or that I'm a fan of, I'll say, like ozone therapy, I'm not a fan of high dose ozone. I know a lot of people are, but low and slow is my preferred method. So I feel like coffee enemas, in my experience, they didn't have any of the Herxheimer reactions, which we can talk about, mm -hmm. but it just seemed to be more gentle and something that also was effective time after time after time with how my symptoms improved almost immediately with the gallstones that I passed. And it's just an incredible option. It definitely is. That was one of the first things I found in mine. And let's just, let's just talk about poop. It's okay. Yeah. We all do it. We, it doesn't need to be weird. Hopefully I, everyone does it. <laughs> true. If everyone yeah. doesn't do it, you need to do it. The stones were one of the first thing I passed. I sent you a picture. I was like, what is this? And they were beautiful. I don't know if it's because I was taking methyl blue, like they were turquoise. <laughs> I showed my kids and my son was like, you should make earrings. Like, no, you know, <laughs> a little too much, but um, it was so satisfying to know that I got that out of me. So I want to talk a little bit about the process because that was something that overwhelmed me and your videos and your course on this will definitely link below because it was so easy. It was so helpful. And I love how on part of it, you were like, never in a million years did I think that this is what I'd be doing with my life, filming myself doing an enema to yeah. teach people how to do it. But let's kind of just walk through like in general, what the process entails so people can kind of get a visual for what this experience is. Sure. So making the enema on the stovetop or some people use French press and there's so many different ways, but just what I was taught was to use a ratio of three tablespoons of coffee to three cups of water. And I've been living with someone for the past six years. We've both done them. So what we'll actually do is take six tablespoons, simmer it in three cups, and then make sure the volume is, so it's like a concentrate, and then add in more cold water, distilled water, so that it's still that same ratio of six tablespoons to six cups of coffee, which is three to three. Now, if you're someone who is caffeine sensitive, maybe start with less. And some doctors will recommend people start with a teaspoon to three cups or one tablespoon to three cups or whatever it might be. But I was able to start with three tablespoons and three cups and have no issues. So making it is the first part. And a lot of the concerns that I see online would be that people would burn their rectum. Okay. We could say this about drinking coffee as well. So in the course, I talk about the pinky test. If you cannot submerge your pinky in the coffee for at least 10 seconds without any discomfort, it's too hot. So please don't ever use a coffee enema that is too hot. That would be so yeah. silly. So making the coffee, the other part that people can find a little challenging is priming it. Now, I don't know if you're using an enema bucket or a silicone enema bag. Which of those do you use? I use the bucket that you recommended. Okay. So I prefer the bucket. I think it's easier to keep clean. It's stainless steel. It'll last years. The silicone is what I use for travel, but a lot of people say that they struggle to get the last little bit out of the bucket. So then you can use your foot, if you're a little more advanced, to tilt it to get the rest out. And the silicone enema bag is really easy if you struggle with that. It empties from the bottom. 
And then I also show how to prime the tubing so that you don't have air in it. It's not like having air in an IV, which could be potentially lethal. It would just give you gas pain, which is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I show how to actually prime the tubing. And then I like to insert it while standing up. And due to our anatomy, laying on the left side allows for facilitation of the coffee enema to go inside and through the rectum. Some say it's absorbed by the hemorrhoidal veins, but I've always been taught that we want to get it up to the portal vein near the liver. So once the coffee's all the way in, you would lay on your right side. And once again, more is not better. I've been told never to hold longer than 20 minutes. I know some people do that based on the recommendations of their doctor, but I was told 12 to 15 minutes max. And the reason for that is because if you leave it in too long, it would then recirculate toxins through the body. Mm, okay. And then the last part is evacuating. So maybe the last minute or so people will lay on their left side so that it can go back down towards the rectum. And then you sit on the toilet and more than liquid comes out for sure. Perfect. Thank you. And that whole process is actually really easy, especially once you walk me through it. Um, we've made it part of our regular routine. Jason does them as well. Uh, mm -hmm. The boiling, the coffee doesn't take long. I'll usually go out and just do a quick walk while I'm waiting for it to cool down. Pinky test, the whole setup takes me about four minutes. Mm -hmm. We've got like this amazing towel rack in our bathroom that sits just above the tile ledge so we can tilt the bucket. So it empties perfectly. It's like it was made for a coffee enema bucket. And you're done in like, I mean, like you said, try to retain for 12 minutes. So the whole process is like 15 minutes, easy peasy. I want to talk a little bit about um, why coffee, does caffeine matter? If so, why? And then obviously source of coffee is important. Yes. Okay. So a lot of people ask, especially if they are caffeine sensitive by mouth, I'm one of those people. If I drink coffee, I feel very anxious. So mm -hmm. I understand that concern. And as always, I'm not here to tell you that coffee enemas are right for you. My course teaches you how to do it if you've been given the green light from your doctor. So why caffeine instead of decaf? Because caffeine contains palmitic acids, which are short chain fatty acids. And those allow for the production of, ooh, they're very big words, but um, basically it allows, we'll go a little further in the chain because I can't recall the words off the top of my head, but the production of GST, glutathione as transferase, which then helps with glutathione production, particularly in phase two of the liver. So if it's decaf, you're not going to have the palmitic acids that you need to be able to eventually get to the GST and the glutathione production. Got it. Okay. So it has to be caffeinated. The first time I did it, um, and again, thank you so much for your support. I did the regular ratio. I, If I have coffee at all, it's like a four sigmatic mushroom, very low caffeine, um, lots of adaptogens in there. And I, it, it was like super caffeine. I had to go out and run. Like I went for probably a three mile run. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, which was fun, but you had me cut down. I think I did two tablespoons um, to three cups water and that's what I do now. And it's totally fine. Yep. Everyone's different. So listen to your body. And just because it's, it's been recommended to hold for 12 minutes, I will never tell someone to override what their body is telling them. So if it's six minutes, your body's like, it's time for me to let this go. Then listen to that. What I mean by that might be nausea, chills, or just feeling like I'm going to, I'm just going to poop my pants. If you have that feeling. So I learned this after I made the course, but some people will take binders about 30 minutes before. And that makes sense because what's happening when you do the coffee enema. So it goes in through the rectum. Um, we get it through the portal vein. And what happens is that the caffeine and the palmitic acids dilate the bile duct. So that will release bile from the liver into the intestines. And if you have a binder there, that makes it a lot more easy for people to hold. So I've never struggled with that. I would just release it early if I needed to. And it's different. I notice when I'm parasite cleansing in certain times of the month, usually full moon, it is harder to hold sometimes, but I don't judge myself for it. And it's not a competition for how long you can hold it. Just listen to your body. Perfect. So that's totally normal. I was going to ask you what comes to mind if people are having difficulty retaining, especially mm -hmm. if it fluctuates. So totally normal. You think just different parts of the detox pathways and process happening in our bodies. Also, if it's cold, I think it's harder to hold mm. because think about it. If it's cold, it's going to almost constrict that area. So never hot, but I prefer something on the warmer side, but never hot. The other thing is if you haven't had a bowel movement that morning, have a bowel movement first, because that can just feel like a lot of pressure down there. Mm-hmm. 
And I think that's it as far as temperature and making sure that your bowels have been eliminated prior. Okay. And let's talk about more around like what this does for the liver and gallbladder. So I know you've expressed just, you know, in your nursing career, how many gallbladder removals you saw and what role do you feel like coffee enemas play in our health of our gallbladders? So it's really sad because gallbladders are taken out all the time. People have gallbladder attacks and that pain is real. I mean, these people are sweating pale. I'm not in any way denying that experience, but my question is, especially after about four months into doing them, I would fill the toilet with gallstones. Showed my doctor, it was wild. Also, when I take methylene blue by mouth, I noticed that they are a greenish color. <laughs> so if we did more coffee enemas, if they were medically appropriate uh, for the person and took something called Tudka, I think we would not have as many people dealing with gallstones and just this this pain that we have. So we're told your gallbladder is full of stones, so we need to take it out. I think that we should keep our organs whenever possible. So what if there was something we could do to prevent it from getting to that point? So once you're in a crisis, I don't think that a coffee enema would be sufficient. So that's why over the years, I've noticed how many have come out. When I first started doing them, they were much bigger, much darker. And over the years, they've become very, very small and almost like a light yellowish color, which I thought was interesting also. With all the people that you've worked with, what else have people talked about coming out? A lot of people say parasites. I'm not here to diagnose anything. Mm -hmm. I'll just call it an unidentified object, which it certainly is. Uh, all kinds of things. I mean, my DMs, my photos on my phone, all sorts of things. But I'm never going to tell someone this is a parasite because I don't know. And I believe about 70% of parasites are microscopic and not visible to the human eye. However, I've done some cell core and other types of parasite cleansing, especially with oregano oil, and I have passed extremely long unidentified objects. So I focus on how I feel afterwards versus trying to identify what the object is, mm -hmm. but they are used for parasites. My understanding is that um, parasites do not like the coffee and the coffee enemas, also a lot of greens and things like that. Uh, mucoid plaques. That's another thing that people assume is a parasite, but it's just old debris. You know, for eating things that are, it's not really food. Great example, McDonald's. If you can leave a sandwich on the counter for what years and it's not going to yeah. break down, how is our body going to break down something? So all sorts of things that have accumulated in the colon and in the intestines in general, we can help to remove out. But once again, the primary goal is for glutathione production. And what do people tend to report to you about how they feel after coffee enemas or, you know, once incorporating them regularly? Okay, great question. Um, fewer headaches, fewer menstrual cramps, a more clean, sustained energy. It is totally different than drinking coffee by mouth, which we briefly covered. I know that a lot of people do the Gerson protocol who have cancer, and that's up to six coffee enemas a day. Oh, wow. So it can be used for all different things, but mostly just a clear headed feeling and a lighter feeling. What would you say? Yeah, I've been doing them. Let's see. It was probably three weeks ago. Maybe I did your course or a month ago. Okay. Um, I feel a lot of clarity. I did do a little bit of a parasite cleanse during the time. I had some brain fog during that for sure. So I'll be repeating a parasite cleanse, but I've had an incredible amount of energy just even in general, like when mm -hmm. I wake up throughout the day. Um, I feel clear. I feel light. I feel just like clean. Yeah. Something else that I've learned since making the course is that, and this really blew my mind, that it can be very helpful for the vagus nerve. And that was really hard for me to wrap my mind around because why would coffee help the vagus nerve? And if you're able to breathe through the waves that come during a coffee enema, it should never be painful, but that coffee is actually putting pressure on the vagus nerve. And so a lot of people feel a lot more relaxed, which is very interesting. And another thing about Tudka, which I briefly mentioned, so Cellcore, I work with them and they teach about Tudka enemas. So I will say that I was living with my boyfriend last year and he was taking, I told him about Tudka enemas, but I didn't know he was actually taking the capsule and putting them in there. And I just felt so much rage. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned to me that he was putting it in there. And that makes sense because in Chinese medicine, where do we store a lot of our anger in the liver? So Tudka was incredible for helping with that. But if I take two 
Tudka capsules about 20 minutes before, and I would not recommend this for anyone who's starting out. Always ask your doctor. This is not medical advice, just educating on different things about coffee enemas. If I take one to two Tudka capsules, and the ones that I use are from Cellcor, 20 to 30 minutes before a coffee enema, gallstones everywhere. It's wild. What's Tudka? Tudka. Very long word also. And we can put these in the show notes so that okay. people can see. I'm not just making this up, but let's see. What does Tudka stand for? Toro Urso Deoxychloric Acid. There we go. So Tudka essentially stimulates the liver, I'm assuming? The release of uh, bile acid oh. and therefore a lot of gallstones come out. So it can be treated, it can be used in treating um, like liver stagnation and bile acid backup in the liver. Um, So that's something that I would not recommend. The only time I've ever pooped my pants in over a thousand enemas, and I'll also explain why I was given that protocol, was when I did a Tudka enema. So that is not something I would ever recommend starting with, but Tudka is something that I would recommend looking into with or without coffee enemas. I think that would be something that helps a lot of people keep their organs if we were more educated and incorporated that. For sure. Yeah. Do you want to talk about your protocol? So I worked with this Chinese medicine doctor and once again, I thought I was so open-minded and he said two coffee enemas a day for two years. I'm like, this man has lost his mind. He's lost his mind. There's no way I'm going to do that. Well, about four to six months later, everything that he shared was going to happen to my body as far as my adrenals running on fumes, HPA, axis dysfunction, uh, toxin overload, liver stagnation, like everything came to light. And I'm like, all right, I'm ready to listen. But t- mm-hmm. two years, I mean, that's a big commitment. And he told me that it would take at least a year for me to really, truly heal and feel better. I didn't want to hear that. I was used to Western medicine where you take something, you feel better in 30 minutes. So I was really struggling with that. However, I live next to an oil refinery in California, in El Segundo area, near LAX as well. And my doctor did a non-metal toxins test. And there's this chemical MTBE, also a very long name. But that is not something that occurs in nature. It's a byproduct from gasoline and other things. So in 2009, I believe they banned the use of that, but there was no cleanup ordered. So it was present in the water and in the soil where I was living. So my levels were 6,000 times higher than they should be. Oh my gosh. What were your symptoms? If anyone's ever seen on my Instagram account, I have it pinned, but literally head to toe, my entire body was covered in hives. I saw five doctors was on nine different meds, nothing remarkable on their blood work, but it was awful. And then whenever I started to detox and even the dermatologist said it, it's almost like a controlled burn. So at that point, I stopped the coffee enemas because I'm like, wait, I don't want to detox faster than I can eliminate. And I learned about drainage and things like that. But actually the coffee enemas, although they help us detox, they also facilitate elimination. So I was advised to continue doing those. I also checked with my integrative DO. A DO is a very mainstream doctor. We have those in the hospital. She was more open to alternative things. And she said, if you're going to be doing that much, my concern would be Uh, just drying out the colon. So she had me do castor oil enemas in a fleet enema bottle every week or so. And what's so interesting is people think that if you do a lot of enemas, you're not going to be able to go to the bathroom on your own. Now, if you poop one to three times a day and you start coffee enemas and you notice that, then I wouldn't recommend continuing and talking to your doctor about that. In my case, I was going probably three times a month. I didn't feel like I had pain. And I actually was taking care of patients who were hospitalized. I'm like, why, why is everyone pooping all the time? Like, I really didn't understand that people went that much. So that actually allowed me to go from about three times a month to about four times a week, which was incredible. So as always, we're all different. And in my case, it was very extreme. I wouldn't recommend most people do a two a day for two years. Mm-hmm. But in my case, because of how overwhelmed my body was, I learned about MTHFR and other things that were impairing methylation. So I'm so grateful that I did them. And yeah, it it greatly improved my quality of life. I don't deal with any rashes at all anymore. Yeah, your skin's beautiful. I've seen those pictures on your Instagram. It's crazy. And then how long did it take you? You know, obviously over time, I'm sure things were improving, but just curious, how long did that whole process take you to get back to baseline health for you? Well, something that really changed the game for me was ozone therapy. 
Mm. So at this integrative DO's office, she suggested that I do ozone therapy at the time. It wasn't FDA approved, but it was experimental. I could sign a waiver. I was suffering so much. I, I just didn't care. And back up a little bit. I remember one night I went to the ER because it was so bad, my symptoms. And I got a cortisone shot, I believe, just to help with the rashes and everything. I remember leaving the hospital, looking up at the sky, and it was a full moon, which now I've correlated a lot of the mood symptoms and the rashes to the full moon, which is when parasites are more active. And parasite cleansing is also something that changed my life. But in the meantime, you know, detox and essentially rebuilding our body can take time. And we don't want to rush through that process. I learned that. So ozone therapy, I did IV ozone therapy, two treatments. My rashes went from, I'd say, 80 to 90% of my body to about 25% of my body. Wow. And it was incredible. So that's amazing for inflammation and infection. And I'm actually doing it at home right now, vaginal ozone insufflation for a swollen lymph node in my groin and three treatments and it's half of the size. So wow. once again, I'm not saying that's right for everyone, but it's yeah. such a life changer for me. Yeah. It's really, you know, about finding our own our own journey and the tools that work for us. And that's why it's just so great to have, you know, exposure to this kind of knowledge and people can pull from it what they want. You know, your skin is such an incredible detox organ. So although I'm sure that was so uncomfortable to experience and frustrating until you figured it out, how beautiful that you could literally in an instant, you know, see what was changing in your body's pathways. Mm -hmm. You had instant feedback. It was so obvious. You didn't, obviously you're getting the functional blood work to see what's going on in a deeper level, but you just had to look to see your progress. Yes. And it was, once again, something that took a long time to get my functional labs back to a normal level. Happy to report, I don't have MTBE levels that are off the charts. They were within what would be an appropriate range, but that's not something we're testing for. I mean, my memory was so bad. I also was working night shift. There were many factors at play here, mm -hmm. but my memory was so bad that I met someone and she said, Hey, Ashley. And it, she was friends with my roommate. I've never seen her before. And that's when I started to really get scared. I was in my late twenties at the time. I didn't know what was wrong, but my body was just so overloaded. And the other thing that is controversial, but leaky gut, or we can call it increased intestinal permeability. That was something I was dealing with. So I hear mixed things. If you should deal with that before detoxing or after, but in my case, doing something for that totally helped. And then think about it. It's a tube from here all the way down. Right. And if you do have more permeability and you're eating food, especially if you can't digest it well, can it leak through that GI tract into the bloodstream and cause more inflammation? Yeah. So like I said, many factors at play. Amazing. Wow. Thank you so much. So much great information. Okay. I have a few questions. I had let a few people know I was going to be doing this interview and I got some questions. Um, what is the difference between a colonic and an enema? Okay, great question. They are very different. The primary goal of a colonic is to remove stool. I find it to be much more invasive and uncomfortable because it's a much larger amount of fluid. My understanding is that it can be liters, but it's going much higher up. So, and I've done those before, but you let it infuse until you're at your limit. I often feel very nauseous when I'm doing it. I, I don't care for it. That can really disrupt the microbiome as well. And for whatever reason, coffee enemas, that has not been my experience. And I do functional testing for my gut every year. So I would say colonics are better for someone who is impacted, someone who is looking to deal with constipation or can help with detox as well. But the coffee enemas are more for the glutathione production and the liver support. Got it. Super important. I think that's a really, really major distinction, right? So it's the only, only the coffee enemas essentially are what's helping our body produce glutathione, mm -hmm. increasing the detox. How about for people that have hemorrhoids? Is it recommended to use these if you have hemorrhoids, active hemorrhoids or hemorrhoids in general? I'm always going to be on the conservative side. I'm always going to tell people to ask their doctor as well. What I've learned about hemorrhoids is that they can be exacerbated by liver congestion. So in theory, it could be helpful, but if they're bleeding, I wouldn't recommend it. If you have hemorrhoids, I, would, I wouldn't do them. I would wait until they're gone. But also if you're sitting on the toilet straining, please use a squatty potty or just get a stool or a trash can, 
but you never want to strain because that can be something that occurs with just regular bowel movements. Perfect. And Squatty Potty will be linked below. We're going to have all the resources, the tools needed for the enemas, Squatty Potty. Amazing. That's the position we're actually supposed to be in when we're using the toilet. So we'll make sure that's easily accessed below. What's the difference between um, a coffee enema and then like a pre, pre, what is it? Pre saline filled enema? A fleet enema? Yes. So I mentioned that in the beginning and those are much smaller and those just flush out stool in the lower part of the colon. Okay. Okay. So we do those a lot. If someone has a bowel obstruction, maybe they have an NG tube and we're trying to get that out. That's one of the most unpleasant things I'd ever want to have to receive as a patient. You're awake for the whole thing. It's just, just, they say it's so uncomfortable, but that's more so if you are constipated and you need to get something out of the lower part of the colon. Got it. Okay. I didn't realize those were the same thing as the fleet enema. So mm -hmm. that is similar stool removal, not impacting glutathione. Correct. Okay. Perfect. Well, those were the main questions I got. I feel like you answered so much stuff. Um, highly, highly recommend your course linked below. If you have not gotten into doing coffee enema yet, definitely. I recommend it. I know this isn't, we're not here to give medical advice. It has actually absolutely been a game changer for my health how I feel on the daily, whether it's from parasites, chronic Lyme, being a mom of three kids, just all of it, you know, detoxing on the regular basis. Ashley, one more question for you. I know you have a ton of resources on your website. What are the things you're most passionate about helping people with in addition to Coffee Enema, just so anyone can reach out to you for any um, additional support? Right now, I am a certified functional medicine health coach. So you can have the best protocol in the world. But if you do not have the life skills to follow through with it, meaning boundaries, meaning um, if you're a procrastinator, let's figure out why. So I do a lot of life coaching and that really helps people see their patterns because unfortunately in the medical system, well, not unfortunately, we need someone to prioritize the physiological well-being. We want to make sure that your heart's beating and all of that. But there's not a lot of emphasis on the mental, emotional, um, and spiritual aspects of one's well-being. So my approach is more holistic. We look at all of the person. We look at how stress impacts a person's well-being. And also if you have an aura ring or some type of feedback device, even this past week, as I've been going through some things, um, it's registered it as a workout. I'm like, no, that's just anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so we can't see stress. And so to be able to help people make these connections and figure out what works best for them is what I do as a coach. And I'm expanding, I'm doing um, the FDN Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Program. So I'll be able to help clients access functional labs so they can get a deeper look at what's going on. I just started a podcast, High Maintenance Hippie Podcast, talking about all sorts of things. And yeah, I just feel that my coaching is a balance of both health and life coaching. You can't have one without the other. You can't have a great life without health and vice versa. So that's what I'm working on. And my website is under construction, but it should be out very soon. And then also planning retreats. Um, we are so used to going, going, going. And when I got sick in 2018, to slow down and to be with my thoughts and not work for a year was so challenging because that's where I derived my worth, to be perfectly honest. So mm -hmm. a lot came up that I had to deal with, but many of us are afraid to slow down and more is not better, whether that's coffee enemas, whether that's ozone, whether that's um, setting goals and pushing ourselves, you know, we have to be able to know the seasons of our body and all that. So really helping people learn to listen to their body, find what practices are right for them and get them to take an active role in their health. I'm not anti-doctor, but they're not with you all the time. So let's try to bridge the gap and empower people to take an active role in their health. So beautiful. I'm so excited for your podcast. We'll link that below. We'll link your website below. You know, I know some of your story of what you went through when you were nursing and why you, you know, transitioned out of that field. Anyone can find out about that by following your platforms. And it's so interesting because I feel like these things that happen for us help create and help us find our message for the world. And that's clearly what you're doing in such a beautiful way. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm so grateful. And without that experience in 2018, I worked with some practitioners then who said, you'll be grateful for this one day. I did not want to hear that. I was like, yeah, please, oh yeah. please stop saying that. Yeah. But in all honesty, I am so grateful because I got to see what it was like to be the patient where you're told we're doing everything we can, but clearly that was not the situation because there was so much more that helped me. 
I'll also say a circadian lifestyle. It's free. Please look into that. It's not a fancy biohack. And I think we really underestimate the power of sunlight and our mitochondria and ATP and all of that. So yeah, those are the things that I learned and it was a blessing in disguise. Absolutely. And I love too, that you touched on that you had to spend a lot of time in quiet, you know, you were forced to and how uncomfortable that was. And I think a lot of us in different seasons of our lives, if we're not ready for that yet, we avoid it. Like you said, we distract ourselves because whether it's our job, our emails, those little dopamine rushes, that's where we get our sense of self-worth. But when we can be brave enough and courageous enough to go into that quiet and to sit with it, that's, I really feel that's where we step into our calling. That's where we step into our light, our sense of being, our sense of worth without all these distractions. And when we can get to that, I feel like that's where we can really rise up and serve others on such a high level, which I know you're doing. So again, thank you for your time. I'm so glad to have you on the podcast and so excited to see all your future projects. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Melissa. I really love this. This was fun and I can't wait to hear it. Awesome. I'll see you soon. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Ashley. I walked away with so many more resources and so many of my questions answered on Enema, and I hope you did too. Uh, Be sure to reference the show notes for any resources. If you like this episode, go ahead and throw a like under it. I always love to hear your comments and feedback, so go ahead and add a comment. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And of course, of course, be sure to pass this on to someone in your life that you know can benefit from this information. Thank you.